The following podcast is brought to you by Cast Content Media. Welcome to Dixie and the King. I'm an Elvis tribute artist rocking the cradle with a much younger wife. And we are coming together to figure out this thing called life. Take this journey with us through our unique and fascinating relationship as we tackle marriage, parenting, and spirituality. We find ways to live a better life through our experiences and learn from professionals and everyday folks along the way and how to thrive in today's world. And welcome to Dixie and the King. My name is George Gray and my beautiful wife, Dixie. Thank you so much for tuning us in. I am so excited for this particular podcast because this happens to be one of my bestest friends in the whole world. We've known each other for six months now. No, actually, we've known each other for quite, for, for quite some time. Before we get to him, we want to thank Cast Content Media for sponsoring our podcast and we also want to tell you that you can find us on our website, which is DixieandTheKing.com and YouTube at Dixie and the King. Uh, tune us in on Spotify and tune in radio. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you can, uh, you'll find us on Rumble and you'll also find us on, on uh, CastContentMedia.com. There's going to be hosting all kinds of podcasts and we're really excited about the partnership with those folks. So... Uh, one thing that Dixie, if you've watched all of our or some of our podcasts, you realize that we are a blended family. I have two adult, adult daughters and she has two uh, younger daughters. And of mm-hmm. course, we have a son. But one thing that's very important in our life is music. Yeah. And Dixie recently has... Um, well, let me ask you, did, did you play an instrument growing up? Did you I know? never played an instrument growing up. And, you know, I've always regretted that. I still don't know how to read music. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that I really want to introduce my kids to because, again, I really have always regretted that. Yeah. I, uh, I was a trumpet player in, uh, in, through most of my life and then French horn, which I really enjoyed the French horn, particularly when I played French horns when Star Wars came out. It just added a lot of depth to that particular song. And then both my daughters played the trumpet, but uh, most of their instrument uh, career kind of ended shortly after high school. It's one of those things I wish. And I have a guitar that I can, I can pick and right. pretend like I know how to play. I actually, I think I know like four I, chords. I think so. that you actually bought me a guitar right before I went on maternity leave thinking mm-hmm. that I would have all this time yeah. as I was home with a baby to learn how to play the guitar. The that gu- did not happen, but it's still sitting there and and I have ambitions one day. Hey, one day, one of these yeah. days. But anyway, what we're getting at is today's podcast. We're going to be talking about the gift of music and how not only does it affect the world, but also affects our children. And I have a very special guest who is all the way in Manhattan, New York. Let's all say good morning or good afternoon, I guess, to Glenn Cortese. Good morning, Glenn. Hi, George. Hi, Dixie. How are you? We're doing good. We're doing really good. So before we actually get into the nuts and bolts of this, because our podcasts are all about how can we keep ourselves healthy and happy, particularly with the pandemic and everything that's going on in our world. But uh, Glenn has has quite the resume. Go ahead and fill us in. Who is Glenn Cortese? Well, I am a uh, orchestra and opera conductor and composer. I've been conducting things since I was about 20 years old. So that's 40 years. And um, writing music since I was about 21 or two years old and uh, I also work as an arranger. I work for music publishers as a freelancer and uh, I've done some music for film. So I, my whole uh, adult life has been a career in music. And I, I first met uh, Glenn here in Greeley. Uh, It just so happens to be the oldest Philharmonic west of the Mississippi, and it's called the Greeley Philharmonic. Been around since. Do you remember when that started, Glenn? Uh, let's see. My my second year there, which was two thousand and seven, I believe, was the hundredth anniversary year. So, yeah. I guess nineteen oh seven. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that wow. crazy? Wow, that's so amazing. Been, yeah, and I was very fortunate that um, I wasn't. I was on the board of the Greeley Phil, and I was with them for I don't know three hundred years. It seemed like, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> had a wonderful time. But uh, the old maestro was retiring, and so uh, the Greeley Philharmonic put out the call for a, a, um, a new conductor, and they narrowed it down to three, and Glenn just so happened to be one of those. And we were extremely fortunate to have you as the, uh, as the conductor for the Greeley Phil for, for many, many years. So uh, you also, if I remember correctly, because I've known Glenn now for many, many years, that uh, he likes to hang around with people like Elton John and Billy Joel and uh, <laughs> Prince Charles, I think, is some of those others. <laughs> no, I, I, did, I did, did have the great fortune of getting to work with Billy Joel once on a project, but not the others. So Yeah, um, but still, that's, still that's, that's pretty cool. When you work in music, you cross paths with all kinds of people in different places in their life. And sometimes there are people that happen to be famous. And um, the job I was hired to do for Billy when I was first hired, I didn't even know whose music I was working with. Uh, it was done through Sony. And they just said, we have these piano pieces that are recorded, but there's no sheet music and we need somebody t to transcribe them. So there's actual sheet music. Are you interested? And I said, well, you know, let me take a listen. And um, I got it. And I said, actually, this is really uh, great music. Whose is it? And they said, well, just do one piece, you know, transcribe one piece. <laughs> and we'll see how we like it. And I did that. And then finally they told me it was his music. So he, his the last album he made was um, an all piano music album. It wasn't any songs. Uh, with lyrics, so that that was my part of the project, and then being at the recording sessions, and that's how it how it happened. So you never know who you're going to run into in this business. You never know, and of course, uh, living in New York, which is the cradle of of entertainment, has got to be just really exciting for you. So uh, one thing I wanted to get into, we we're just talking about the influences on children, but before we get into that, w with the pandemic, how are musicians and conductors and uh, and even philharmonics and orchestras, how are they surviving? Well, you know, I think a lot of it depends on the size of the organization. It's interesting that the smaller ones are now more active probably than the really big ones because they have more flexibility in terms of the practicality of their contract. Uh, you know, a giant machine like the New York Philharmonic or the Metropolitan Opera, they're basically shut down because they can't really um, make it work financially to bring everybody back to work and to not be playing for live audiences. So. Uh, there's more flexibility with the with the more flexible group, groups at the smaller scale. Um, what a lot of us are doing now is we're doing performances that we record in a, a responsible way, everybody distanced on stage with masks, um, and then we uh, make a video of that, and we then uh, have the concert available as a um, recorded video concert, or sometimes it's live streamed. And that's how we're reaching people now. Also through radio broadcasts, I'm doing a lot of um, work with NPR with one of my orchestras up in Schenectady, where we um, uh, have concerts that were recorded in the past, played on the air, and then I do commentary around them. So uh, we're active, but certainly not active in the way that everybody remembers. And it'll be a long time before things really are completely back to uh, normal, whatever normal is going to be. Um, in the next few years. Um, I think we'll see probably within the next year or so the reintroduction of some live audience performances at, at a small scale. Um, and that will probably with a lot of organizations be along with the video recording. So if people feel comfortable going live, they can. And if people don't, they'll be able to, to watch it later. Um, that might be kind of the hybrid way to do it in the interim. but. Uh, it's greatly affected the industry for a while. No one was doing anything at all. Um, I know a lot of uh, individual musicians who are not performing now are certainly refining their practice skills. So when we're on the other side of this, I think everybody will be way more accomplished than they were before they went in or, or at a much even higher level. Um, and I know a lot of us who are composers or uh, work in publishing have been taking advantage of the time to do that kind of work where we don't have a as rigorous of a performance schedule. So we're working on our writing projects instead. So what are musicians doing as far as like finances? How, how are the individual musicians and or conductors um, staying afloat themselves? Well, uh, a lot of them are on unemployment if they're with larger organizations. Um, some of them were doing multiple jobs anyway. For example, with an orchestra like Greeley, no one plays in the Greeley Philharmonic full-time. It's a part-time job. So a lot of the people in it are 
uh, university professors or they have other things that they do with their life. So uh, my assumption is that they're all continuing to do their other jobs and with whatever performances they are able to put together in the in the way that I mentioned, they're doing those, but certainly uh, everyone's um, livelihood has been drastically affected by the pandemic if you're a performing artist in one way or another. Some people completely, if it was their full-time job and some people in part, if it was a part-time job. Yeah, we've definitely experienced that, you know, with George being a performer, um, you know, luckily this, that isn't his full-time job, but it, it was a big part of that. So, um, yeah, we've been trying to get creative too and doing some things via Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. It's just uh, not the same to, you know, you're just missing that audience interaction. And I would imagine the orchestras feel the same way. Yeah. I know a lot of my friends who are faculty members at universities who teach music are also on really bizarre schedules because a lot of their students are from Asia. So they're teaching really early in the morning, which is nighttime there or really, really late at night, which is morning there. So they have these days where they start at seven in the morning and they work till 10. And then they have this big, huge long day with, with no students in it and then more students at night. So their, their lives have been really turned upside down in terms of their schedule and figuring out how to teach. You know, How do you teach piano on Zoom? It's, it's difficult. You have to demonstrate to the students in a different way. Um, what a lot of them are doing is the students are preparing their lessons ahead and sending a recording to the teacher rather than just playing it live. The teacher listens to the recording and then in the lesson does some demonstrating, but it's more of a critique of what they've been working on because they can't really have the same teaching experience over Zoom as they can live in the room. I'm starting to see, Glenn, also uh, some very creative ways where some orchestras, uh, philharmonics, uh, they're smaller ones that are doing the Zoom where everybody has uh, a camera in their particular house or or studio and they're putting these together. Is that something, have you experienced that? Or are, you, are you looking at doing something I, I like that? I haven't been involved with a project like that yet, but I've seen it done. I, I do know it takes a tremendous amount of technical resource to get that all put together. And the larger the group, the more it takes to sync everything together. So. You know, you'll notice that a lot of those performances are very short, and there's a yeah. reason for that is because the time it takes to uh, sew all that together and sync it all up is is formidable. So I'm not sure we'll see live full orchestra performances of an entire symphonic work done that way. I think it might be so um, time consuming and expensive to make it happen that it would just not make any sense. I, I could be wrong. I'm not. I'm not a technical expert when it comes to this, but. That's what I understand from the people who are doing that is they're usually relatively short and small clips and they're great when they work. I mean, they're very inspiring to see people coming together like that from all over the world to make something happen. Right. Um, and when I think about orchestra music, you know, oftentimes when we would go to performances, one thing I noticed is the audience tends to be a little bit older. Um, and I think that it's so important that we be bringing in our, you know, the younger generation and our kids into these performances. And I have to tell you, Glenn, one of my favorite ways you guys did this with the Greeley Philharmonic was you um, put on the, the show Fantasia. And I thought that that was a great way to introduce the little kids to the orchestra and maybe spark their interest where they'll want to come, um, you know, to, to future shows and so do you know like what what is it about orchestra music that's so important to kids well i i think it's not just orchestra music i think it's culture in general is important to kids but specifically with with instrumental music um there's nothing better than having your child take up an instrument and it doesn't mean they're all going to turn into professional musicians but it does so many things for them in terms of what they gain from it. It teaches patience, responsibility, mm -hmm. it boosts their mm -hmm. self-esteem when they start to make progress and, and you know, perform better in, in whatever little thing that they're working on. It improves their reading skills, not only music reading, but regular reading because they're having that interaction in real time with something that they have to read. Uh, exposes them to new cultural backgrounds because some of the music they're playing is from other countries. It enhances their physical coordination when they're playing an instrument their math skills because of the way music is put together with rhythm, their memory capacity, 
and even social skills if they're involved in performing with other kids. So there's so many parts of it. I mean, it's like sports in a way. It exposes people to uh, interacting with others for a common goal when they play instruments with other people. They have to, to work really hard to get the result that they want. And um, it's a team sport, as it were. When you work with other people playing music together, you have to function as a, as a team. So there's so many aspects of it that are useful. And it also teaches them then the appreciation that if they don't go on to play an instrument professionally or even drop it, it gives them an appreciation for the art form and for culture. So later in their life, they might become a patron of the arts. They might help to support it. So it kind of keeps the whole process moving forward. And um, what, after many, many studies, they, they used to think that smart kids were the ones that were interested in instruments. And what they realized later was playing an instrument actually makes a kid smarter because of all the reasons mm -hmm. that I that I brought yeah. up. So it's a great thing um, to have your child participate in that if it's something that they have an interest in. And I, I think especially now in a world where so much of learning is done in small little bits and bytes, as it were, through computer learning and through uh, on-screen learning, having something where they really have to focus and apply themselves teaches them perseverance and determination uh, in a world where a lot of how they're getting information is not that way. It, it's, it's immediate kind of gratification and fast pulses of information and learning an instrument really takes more dedication. So it teaches that those values, I think, to a young person. And so what age would you recommend a child start learning an instrument? You know, I think it's different for every child and there's different ways of teaching. Uh, there's a whole method called the Suzuki method where they start children very young with instruments, especially string instruments. There's Suzuki string lessons and piano lessons. Um, I started when I was really young just because I had this interest in it that my mom recognized and I started piano at four and at that point, wow. other than Suzuki yeah. kids, that was kind of unheard of. Nobody started that young. But um, nowadays, kids are starting that young and sometimes even a little younger. So I think it just depends on the, on the child, what kind of interest level they have, and how early the parents expose them to music uh, as, the, as an infant. Because um, if they hear music a lot, they're probably going to spark an interest in that child uh, by the time they're able to start talking and understand what it is and what they're listening to. So um, it varies, but I would say anywhere between four and six is a good time to get started. So I have an eight-year-old who just expressed an interest in uh, learning the violin. Is that something you would recommend you start a child with, or would you recommend that they all start, say, with piano lessons, or does it really matter? Is it really just what they're interested in? I think a lot of it has to do what they're interested in, but I think for anybody learning any instrument, having some background in piano is really, really valuable. And it, um, it's for young kids, sometimes when they're learning the violin, um, it can be frustrating because making a good sound and playing in tune is way more difficult on the violin than it is on the piano. I mean, as long as the <laughs> piano's tuned and you're pressing the right keys, you're playing in tune. On the violin, it all has to do with the position of your left hand. And also making the sound has to do with how you're using your bow. So you're, you're really um, battling a lot more challenges at a young age like that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't learn the violin when you're young, but I think along with that, if they get a little piano where they get really more immediate response from the instrument and feel like they're accomplishing something more quickly, that might be really helpful. And having that background in piano with any other instrument is always valuable as a teacher later on if they wind up teaching the instrument or just for the, their own enjoyment. No, that makes sense because I could... Uh... I could understand how if you're if you're not doing well immediately with the violin, you might just yeah. give up altogether. So, yeah. which is the last thing and we it want. Takes a lot of perseverance. I mean, even the guitar because it's a fretted instrument. If you're putting your fingers in the right place on the guitar, you're going to get a note that's in tune. Uh, whereas the violin, if it's sort of in the right place, you're sort of going to be in tune. So, <laughs> um, uh, that's uh, another way if they want to just stick with string instruments. That a little bit of background on a fretted string instrument like a guitar or a ukulele could be um, more immediately satisfying because they're going to be playing in tune more quickly.
Yeah, I think I started like a lot of schools. Uh, I want to say it was in middle school, and it was the uh, it was a little black recorder. Oh, <laughs> the recorders. Yeah, and we are not a, my favorite as Mary, a parent. <laughs> yeah, Mary had a little lamb, you know. Yep. So they call them I don't know. Phones, I think the. Uh, Oh, flutophone shell. Uh, I all I know is that it had a fake bell on it. <laughs> that it you didn't need the bell to play the darn right. thing. But no. uh, um, well, that that's very interesting because it, particularly now I think with with a lot of uh, a lot of kids doing their schooling virtually, uh, it's it's kind of difficult to because it's really important for us is is to keep her interest and if she shows an interest, is to try and nurture that interest and. Of course, with violin, you know. Yeah. Well, I even yeah. think about little Carson, who's 19 months old. I mean, we've given him like the little maracas mm -hmm. and a little drum, and and he just loves that stuff. And I just think about like he's been introduced to music in general, listening to the band, you know, George's band play since he was really little. And you can just see he lights up when he sees his dad sing, or when he hears music, he gets really excited. Um, and just introducing kids to different types of music, I think, is really important. I know my daughters know a lot more oldies music and different types of music than their friends do. Um, so it's really cool when an old song comes on and the girls can pick it up and start singing it and know who these people are. And their friends are like, what? What is that? So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's one thing we're going to continue on. We just because uh, I... Because I'm a musician, I'm my intelligence level is amazingly high. <laughs> wow, uh, George, there you want to shrink your head to fit through the door a little bit, or no? But I've always really enjoyed music, and yeah. You know, the other thing that's interesting is uh, back before there was television and computers and radio, mm -hmm. um, the piano was the source of entertainment for many, many households. I, I mean, at one point in New York City area alone there was something like over 150 piano manufacturers because wow. everybody who could afford even an inexpensive piano or a used piano had one in their home because it was the way that you entertained each other. There was no other way other than reading to each other or reading poetry. Um, the piano was the sort of hearth of the home uh, yeah. in terms of entertainment. So um, that year is long gone, but I think that um, having a child understand the value of that and the value of what it means to stick to something, uh, persevere to get better at it, and then start to become really proud of your accomplishment is something that's really, really great training for whatever they're going to do in their life. I mean, teaching discipline and um, perseverance and applying that to either music or becoming a doctor or whatever you're going to do is always going to be helpful. So I think music uh, lessons really breed those skills of those really important qualities to pursue anything of value in your life. Well, and I think when, you know, especially with the pandemic and everything being virtual, I think you see a lot of anxiety and mental health issues rise in our communities. And, and I know for me and, and a lot of folks, music can really um, calm you and really keep you centered and focused so that you don't get caught up in the negativity and, um, you know, the depression of, of what's going on. So I think, yeah, music is just I think so important. And I think there's a national medical study, in, and I don't know if I had talked with you about this, Glenn, that the, there's a part of the brain that, that, can, uh, that causes aggravation and anger issues and those kinds of things and just by simple things like even reading at early age, but musical instruments, learning musical instruments and everything that you just talked about kind of suppresses that part of the brain of, uh, of getting bigger. Well, I, I'm not uh, an expert in that, but I, I would assume that it does have a positive effect. Yeah. And the other thing you mentioned, Dixie, about, you know, um, everything being online and virtual, certainly when you're playing an instrument for yourself or your family, that is not virtual. That's real time. You know, it's yeah. analog. It's you're doing what you're doing at that moment. So uh, at a time where everything has gone the other way because of the necessity of where we are, um, having those things that are actually real uh, I think are even more important than they were before because they ground us, they create um, a different environment that we're from the one that we're stuck in all day when we have to do all these Zoom meetings and, um, you know, video conferences and uh, everything is, is, like you said, virtual. It really does give a break from that and create some space and um, helps your well being to do something that's, you know, you're doing with your hands and it's real. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, 
I think is real, more important now than ever. And I just got a text by one of our listeners, and they said that there is no serial killer that uh, that was a musician. So I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> so. Well, that's Any- good to know, and let, let's, let's keep that tradition, George. Don't have any thoughts there. I mean. <laughs> Well, Glenn, so uh, as we slowly start to wrap up, tell us what's, what's on the schedule for Glenn Cortese out of Manhattan, New York. Well, I have a few concerts this spring. I'm going actually next week up to my orchestra, the Schenectady Symphony, and we have a, an all Bach program that we're doing that we're doing recording on video and then releasing. Um, then later in the spring, I have a couple of um, operas to do, which are going to be kind of interesting because they're going to be short versions and uh reduced orchestras and very different kind of way to produce opera right now um and then i have a concert down in florida in april so i have a few things that are coming up and are going forward but um it's a little strange i have to say i've done a couple of concerts so far since the pandemic started or three i guess and um uh everybody in the orchestra in a mask including me is difficult because a lot of the ways that musicians communicate in orchestra is visually um, because mm-hmm. you can't talk in the middle of a rehearsal or performance unless you stop. So the facial expressions about um, that communication are, are kind of lost with the mask. So uh, it's more difficult. Um, spacing everybody apart is more difficult. But look, I just feel so fortunate that we're getting to make music at all during this really difficult time. So incredibly palpable, you know, it was really, you could feel it in the room. So um, I just feel lucky to be able to do it at all uh, during this really, really challenging time. All right. Well, Glenn, if, uh, if, if anybody wanted to get a hold of you, like to maybe write a, a movie score or something, <laughs> what's the best way to find Glenn Cortese? They can go to glencortese.com and just send me a message and it'll get right to me. So um, that's there all the time. And um, I'm happy to hear from anyone. All right. We'll put that at the bottom of the screen. So, Glenn, yeah. it's always nice to hear from you and uh, our thoughts and prayers for continued success and even greater success for 2021 for you. Thanks. And to you both, too. It was great to see you. And thanks for having me today. Oh, you oh thank you it. so much for coming on. It was great to hear from you. Boy, what a wonderful that podcast number eight. Yeah. So uh, talk with Glenn Cortese, who's just an amazing uh, musician. and uh, very, Claire very from good. Manhattan. I know. It's yeah. so cool. We're really branching out, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, just to let you know, uh, upcoming podcast, we're going to be talking with some good friends of ours who just celebrated, let's see, how many years? Uh, 49 years of marriage, 49 I believe. years. So yeah. we're going to find out wow. what the secrets are to that. Yeah, so that's going to be cool. And one that I'm really excited for, we're going to speak with Elvis Presley's hairdresser. His name is Larry Geller. So that's going to be coming up uh, in a couple of podcasts from now, too. Yes, he's still alive, and he still has a great story. I had an opportunity to, to interview him several oh. years back. He's, he's got a wonderful story. and uh, He's really interested in doing Glenn's hair, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Well, the, Make you look like Elvis. Things that Elvis told his hairdresser, right? I mean, that's 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 where all the so true. That so is, true. <laughs> that is so true. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Dixie and the King, and that's being brought to you by Cast Content Media. You can find more information castcontentmedia.com. Of course, you can find us on our website, which is dixieandtheking.com. Also, don't forget to hit us up on YouTube and hit that like button Do and the subscribe favor, button. Do us a big favor, yes. Hit that subscribe button. That will really help us out. We'd really appreciate that. And yeah. also on TuneIn. And- TuneIn and Spotify. So also, if you have Alexa, you can just tell Alexa to play Dixie and the King, and we will be uh, talking to you right in your home. All right. Yeah. As, and as always, you can uh, contact us by going to contact at dixieandtheking.com. If there's a podcast idea, something you want to learn a little bit more because we still have a couple more shows of some of our fans have actually written in to find out what, what's the secret behind our relationship, what's the secret behind my hair. Maybe, How long does it take him to do his hair? Yeah, about five minutes. Mm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, having having uh, Glenn has been just a, just a pleasure. So thank you so much for watching us and we'll be back 
next week. God bless. Thank you so much for tuning in to Dixie and the King. We know there are possibly millions of podcasts out there, and we really appreciate you landing on ours. We'd love to hear back from you with suggestions, episode ideas, and possible guests. If you'd like to connect to our guests, we would love to share their contact info with you. Feel free to tell a friend and share our podcast with them. To learn more and watch past podcasts, please visit our website, DixieAndTheKing.com. Oh, 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 oh,